welcome everybody. Uh, James, thanks for inviting me to speak. Kudos to James and Fagili and the rest of the team for putting this together. I wish I had this when I was doing what you're doing. Okay, it would have made life so much easier. I wouldn't have killed as many patients as I did. <laughs> no, I think it's really. Oh, I take that back. Uh, <clears throat> so today we're doing ECG in 20 seconds, which is a system I put together several years ago. And the reason I put it together was that I realised that when the nurse handed me the ECG, I had about 20 seconds to figure out whether there was something wrong. At about 20 seconds, she started tapping her toes. You know, do you know what it is, or should I ask somebody else? All right. So 20 seconds, I came up with this, and it's no different than anything else you've done. But it, what I did was I, I worked out what were the highest yield areas in ECG. And I think that's really important. As James said, this morning, you're going to get ECGs and ultrasounds and x-rays and blood gases. This is what I call the bread and butter stuff. This is the stuff that you're going to need to do. And look, in most cases, you're going to have people to assist you. But there are some cases where you're not. I'll show you some of those cases. Okay. Now, I'll start off with this. Up till now, you know, if you're going into internship, you've had the chance to work on the wards, but also a lot of time to study and prepare. Your life changes, and I think you're going to get a talk about life-work balance later on. But you're going to have to put in those yards whilst you're working now. And the best way to do it, and I still think I did this in my medical career, is to case base it all the time. Find a case that you've seen, learn around that case. And I put this slide up. The more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in war. Now, it's been attributed to a lot of people, but it was actually the ancient Spartans that said this. So the more you train outside of what you're doing, the better you'll perform when you're on the wards, okay? It's really, really important. And you've got to find that time to do it. And believe me, it doesn't take a lot of time to hone your skills. So this is the mind map I came up with about eight years, nine, ten years ago when I first started thinking about this. And I started thinking about what's important, you know, the rate, the rhythm, the P waves, all that sort of stuff. And then as we get down to the ST segments and potassium form, syndromes like Brugada syndrome and Wellens syndrome. Who's ever heard of Wellens syndrome? Brugada? Fantastic, well done. Uh, you're ready for me to ask you questions then rather than just teach. So, but ECGs are boring, aren't they? No, they're not. They're actually quite important, and if you know how to decipher an ECG, you're actually a bit of a star, because you'll pick up subtle things. And today I want to teach you some of the subtle things, like the ischemic changes that you might miss, those sorts of things. So, but it's not always dry. You've got, this, you've got a lot of ECG resources, including YouTube videos. I've got a YouTube video up of Kim Kardashian teaching us Mobitz blocks. You can learn everything on YouTube. You've got other sites, you've got my site, resource.com.au, you've got Amel Matu's website, an excellent ECG teacher, you've got Dr. Smith's ECG blog, you've got Life in the Fast Lane, and you've got another site that I run called Own the ECG. You've got a lot of stuff. What you've got to do is you've got to try and work out how you're going to maximise your learning without being overwhelmed. And these guys show us how easy it is to work out an ECG. We'll get the volume up a little. Look at how happy it is to be there. these five cases, five cases that will help us go through the system, but also something you can hang your hat on in terms of learning. So the first case we're going to do is you've admitted a 25-year-old male for a hernia repair. He has no past medical history. He's 25, and he says to you, I've had this kind of feeling in, in my chest. I'm not sure what it is. It's a bit vague. Is it pain? It's not pain. Maybe it's a heaviness. I'm not sure. It lasts him for five seconds. He's got no other symptomatology to go with it. And you say to the nurse, 
could you please do an ECG? He said, really? There's a 25-year-old male with no past history that's had five seconds of rubbish. You want me to do an ECG? Now, you've learned how to be firm, right, and stand your ground and say, yes, I want an ECG. So she does the ECG. She's even more pissed at you now than before because there's an abnormality on the ECG. And she says to you, here, I've marked the important bits for you just in case you can't see them. This was an ECG that was given to me by a nurse and she said exactly that and I as a staff specialist was locoming somewhere. So what happened with this patient? What did I say to the nurse? We'll cover that in a second. Second case, a 24-year-old athlete is admitted straight to the ortho ward for repeated patellar dislocation. He's gone straight to the ward because the orthopod is a team doctor. Uh, you work the patient up, you get an ECG, you know, it's a little bit slow, 42 beats a minute, so you decide to call the cardiology registrar because your registrar is not available and uh, is an orthopedic registrar, doesn't know how many leads that are in the ECG anyway, so you just keep going with that. And she says to you, you idiot, of course it's slow. He's an athlete. And you feel kind of stupid. And she says, don't disturb me again. I'm a very important person. Don't call me again. So you put the thing in the notes and you go, well, I was an idiot, I shouldn't have called. It's 42, of course, he's an athlete. He arrests at 2 a.m. in the morning. What did you miss? Next case, you're in the ED, lucky you overnight, and you see a 19-year-old woman with the most hated presentation of emergency medicine, dizziness. <laughs> Nobody knows what that means. All of a sudden, the nurse does an ECG, says, we've got to move this patient straight to recess. She's in VT, the commotion, everybody's clearing the recess cubicle, that's her ECG. The emergency registrar comes up and says, my God, it's a wide complex tachycardia, yeah? Gives Amy Odorone immediately, you give a bolus, you can start an infusion, whatever you want. She has an asystolic arrest and dies. What did he miss? Next case, a 40-year-old patient, last minute elective admission for carpal tunnel repair. Nobody should die when they come in for a carpal tunnel repair, all right? So this guy, you do an ECG because he says, I've had some indigestion. But it went away with my lantern, that's the ECG. And you say, I'm pretty happy that it's, I'm pretty happy that it's normal. Is that better? Yeah, pretty happy that it's normal. So you put up the notes and you go away for a well-earned break. Code is called on your patient. What did you miss? What subtle ischemic changes did you miss? And the last case is a 40-year-old male comes in with seizures. They last for a few seconds. He's not post-dictal post these seizures. He's an IV drug user on methadone, comes into the ED, and the nurse says, oh, he's just malingering. He's a sinus brady with ventricular topics. You decide that the nurse is probably right. We put it in the notes. The alarm sounds soon. Soon after you leave there, guess which bed? Your patient. What did you miss? Have an approach. Have a system. And that's what the ECG in 20 seconds gives you, a little bit of a system. So they're the main steps. Now, I've put these two little diagrams a series of parallel there because I can only teach it in series. But when you do it, you look at the QRS, you look at the P waves, you do everything in parallel. And we'll go through some of these steps now. So you're 25-year-old for hernia repair with no past history, 25 with a little bit of chest pain. And that's the ECG. Who can tell me what's going on? Yell it out. You know it. ST depression. T wave inversion? ST depression? Where's the T? ST depression. There's certainly T wave inversion. She's marked it for you, damn it. <laughs> T wave inversion. Is it real, babe? So let's go back. The history. I'm interested. Is it arrhythmia? Is it ischemia? They complain of chest pain. I go down the ischemia route of what, of what my system is. If it's palpitations, I might go down the arrhythmia route. And then I look at the rate. Now, how do you calculate the rate? Now, you can use the distance between the RR intervals. One big square is 300. Two is 150, 75, 60. Or use my method. Just calculate all the QRSs along the ECG. In a normal ECG, normal calibration, you spit out an ECG in 10 seconds. Number of complexes, multiply it by six, there's your rate in a minute. Okay? So this guy here, if we do it, he's got uh, 96 beats a minute. 
The rate's important because if it's slow, I start thinking about things like blocks and everything else. If it's fast, my mind goes somewhere else. I start thinking about SVTs and VTs and everything else. And then I have to ask, is it sinus rhythm? And for it to be sinus rhythm, the P wave has to be in an appropriate axis, which means the P wave must be upright in two and inverted in AVR. That's the key. So the P wave must be upright in two and inverted in AVR. So if we look up there, we can see that the P wave is upright in two, inverted in AVR. It's inverted up here in AVR and upright in two, is it? Okay, then the next thing I look at is what's it doing in lead one? It should be upright in lead one. Is it upright in lead one? Yes or no? The P wave is inverted in lead one. Only two things that are going to cause that. Limb lead reversal or dextrocardia. The chances of me seeing dextrocardia are pretty low. So I'm going to bet on limb lead reversal. And this is what this is. It's limb lead reversal. So my response to the nurse was, thank you very much. Could you please go back and do it again? Because you've, you've, you've reversed your limb leads. And when she did, it was a normal ECG. And we worked the patient up very briefly. And a 25-year-old with very vague sy symptoms, he went home. Okay? So it's really important because you've got something with T-wave inversion there that you might start thinking about ischemia and everything else. But if you understand the way the limb lead should be, that's a normal ECG. What if there are no P waves? Well, that's junctional rhythm, sinus blocks. We haven't got time to cover all that today. Let's talk about the second case. 24-year-old athlete admitted to the ortho ward and he's got this bradycardia. So if we look at the rate, what's his rate? He's got... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven complexes, seven sixes of 42. Is it sinus rhythm? So are the P waves upright in two inverted in AVR? Yes, they are. Are they upright in one? Yes, they are. So inverted in AVR, upright in two, and upright in one. So the limb leads are in the right place. The P wave, the P axis is normal, so it's sinus rhythm. The next question we ask when it's slow, especially, are there more P waves than QRSs? Or is every P wave associated with a QRS? And in this particular case, you actually have times where there are more than one P wave. So you've got to look at every lead. What does it mean when you have more than one P wave for every QRS? What does it mean? I'm going to come down there unless you answer. What does it mean? A block of some sort, an AV node of block. Well done. So my approach to this is, are there any more, more P's than QRS's? Think of the navy nodal block. And then I have to look at the PP interval. Because for it to be a Mobitz block of some sort, the PP interval must be regular. If it's not regular, you then start thinking of premature atrial contractions. So the PP interval is regular here, and the trick here is that there is a P hidden in the T wave. Usually when you get Mobitz blocks, you might get a clumping of the waveforms. In this, they don't look like they're clumped. That's because the P waves are hidden in there. You've got to start looking at every lead. So the next thing we do is we look to see what the PR interval is doing. If it's getting progressively longer than you miss a QRS, it's a wanky back block. If it's constant and every now and then you miss a QRS, it's a Mobitz 2 of some sort. And if it's all over the shop, it's a complete heart block. All right? So if we look at that, PP interval is, is regular. The PR interval is the PR interval is the same. So this is a Mobitz 2 to 1 block with the P waves hidden in the T waves. That's what was missed. Why did he arrest? Because Mobitz type 2 blocks can deteriorate at total dissociation. And that's what happened to him. This is total AV dissociation, where there's no relationship between the P's and the QRS's. He braided down and he arrested in the middle of the night. So Mobitz blocks are important. What about this one? You see the clumping. Whenever you see clumping of waveforms, always think of a Mobitz block. This is a classic Mobitz 2 block. And if you look at it, you actually see that there's more P's than QRS's. 
There's no direct relationship, one P wave to each QRS. This is another one, dizziness. All right? So you see a sort of a clumping here of the waveforms down the bottom. Whenever you see a clumping, think of a block. So are there more P waves and QRSs? Yes, there are. You can see them down there. And is the PP interval constant? Yes, it is. And then we look at what the PR interval is doing, and it's getting progressively longer, and then you drop. You drop a QRS. So that's a definition of a wanky back. And usually what happens is the PR interval right after you've dropped the QRS is shorter than the one before. So wanky, now wanky back blocks are usually fine. And if you find, if you did uh, ECGs on a significant number of the athletes that are just doing the Commonwealth Games, a lot of those, or a percentage, say 20% or so of those guys would have a wanky back block. But it disappears on exertion. And there are a whole lot of criteria that we can use for ECGs and athletes, totally different to what we're talking today. This is a woman who comes in with nausea. And you see the clumped waveforms, so we start to think about a Mobitz block of the clumped waveforms. And then we say, is, there, is the P wave axis okay? Well, yeah, the P waves are upright in two, inverted in AVR. They're upright in one. Is there a P wave for every QRS? And if we look at it, we actually see there's more than one P wave for every QRS. So we then go through the PP interval. Is it regular? And it's not. So when the PP interval is regular, you can start thinking about moments. When it's not regular, you think about premature atrial contraction. So what happens in a premature atrial contraction is that you've got a QRS T forming, and then you get another P wave coming down but it's in the relative refractory period, and so it doesn't conduct a QRS. All right? And then it takes a little bit longer for it to get the next QRS coming along. So, this is a, this is a real case. Uh, this is the one that had this complex, wide complex tachycardia that was treated with amiodarone and died. What do people think about this? Is it VT? Is it not VT? How do you diagnose VT? Nobody thought I'd come off the stage, did you? How do you diagnose VT? Regular QRS is a wide, narrow, and wide. Is this VT? It looks like VT. Is it VT? People have, who thinks it's VT? Put your hand up. Who doesn't think it's VT? Who doesn't give a damn? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, good, all right. So, this is why she died. Oh. Yeah. So, it's a wide complex tachy. Now, if you're lucky, because 80% of wide complex tachycardias are VT. However, you've got to be a little bit careful, because in a patient like her who's stable, we get a bit confused because wide complex tachycardia, we need to do something about it. So we get a little bit confused, but it may not be VT. So this is the way we diagnose VT. There's 10 or 11 things. And I go through all of this on resus.com.au, and don't worry about it, there's a video on there that I'll show you at the end that goes, summarises all of this for you. I'll put it up there. Um, We've got all these rules, Brigadas, Griffiths, all these rules. They're too complex. And if you put a group of, and they've done the studies on this, you put a group of cardiologists in a room and they can't agree on what's VT and what's not. And that's the concern. So what happened with this lady? She had a potassium of 9.3. So you give her amiodarone, which is a class 1, 2, 3, 4, blocks out, poisoned all the rest of the sodium channels, she braided down and she died. The key is the rate. It is not VT unless the rate is above 120. It is not VT unless the rate is above 120. Also look at the width. Her rate was 114. And look at the width of those QRSs, they're really wide. When you start getting really bizarre wide QRSs, always think of hypercalemia because what does hypercalemia do? It stretches everything out till it becomes sinusoidal. 
So it's got to be wider than 120 milliseconds, but not too wide. But it's certainly got to be great, uh, faster than 120. So beware. If it's not faster than 120, th think of a hyperkalemia, sodium channel blocked A, or a bundle branch block of some sort. And beware the mimics, all right? These are the ECGs that will trick you. So I've seen people try and take pictures of slides before. Nobody's taken a picture of any slide so far. But several people took a picture of this one. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a 48-year-old male with rigors and a pneumonia. And the, uh, the nurse does an ECG and says to you, he's going into VT. Looks like VT, doesn't it? But if you actually do an ECG, you see that that's his natural rhythm, and all of these are due to his rigors. Okay? The patient's stable, he's looking at you, he's fine. You don't have to jump in and do anything too crazy. This is another one. Looks like VT, but that's his natural complexes, and the rest are rigors here. The other reason it can't be VT is have a look at lead one. You can't have the whole heart going into VT except for this one little area that says, I'm not going to do it. All right, so it can't be right. And this is a halter monitor, VT. Look at this lead, normal complexes. So this is the reading of a, of a young guy who's actually playing video games on his phone. And every time he does this, it records it as VT. Okay? If you want to stress, don't, don't do this, I sh shouldn't tell you to do this, but if you want to stress out your nurses in a reshut cubicle, just slip your hand above the electrode and just tap it really quickly, and it goes into VT and everybody responds very, very quickly to that. Um, what else do we look for in a QRS? Well, I want to know, is it tall, is it small, is it wide, is it narrow? Does it have abnormal morphology like a WPW, a delta wave? And is it clump? Because if it's clump, I've got to go back because I might have missed a Mobus block. Narrow? Look, I don't care. If it's narrow and it's fast, it's either a sinus rhythm or an SVT if it's regular. If it's irregular, think of AF. The important thing is it's going through the AV node. That's why it's got a narrow complex to it. You can get all sorts of variation. You get AV nodal reentry tachyas, uh, you know, a slow fast, this is a fast slow, you get P waves after the kick, nobody cares. If it's narrow and it's regular, it's either sinus rhythm or it's an SVT. We're done. Tall QRS, this is about hypertrophy. And you can use Sokolov's criteria, which is in yellow there, so you get the S wave in V1, the R wave in V5 and 6, and if it's greater than 35 millimetres, it's left ventricular hypertrophy. Is a case of a young guy that comes in, has a syncopal episode whilst playing soccer. Anybody that comes in with a syncopal episode on exertion really needs to be worked up. That's his ECG. Does he have hypertrophy? You don't have to calculate this one. Any time you get the complexes of one lead interacting with the complexes of another, it's hypertrophy. But what else has he got? He's got these dagger-like Q waves here. They're not wide enough to be ischemic. They've got to be at least a millimetre wide to be ischemic. So they're called daggers. I call them the nails that go into this patient's coffin if you don't pick the diagnosis. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is what he's got. And you've diagnosed it on an ECG. You can diagnose it on an echo, on James's echo, and he'll be doing a talk on ultrasound. You can diagnose it on echo in the ED, but you've pretty much got the pre preliminary diagnosis on your ECG. What if it's a small QRS? Pericardial effusion, pleural effusion. So this is the lady that comes in with breast CA, presents with shortness of breath and chest pressure, and she's got these very small complexes. And the other thing you notice is some of them are tall, some of them are small, tall and small. It's called electrical alternance. Don't worry about that. When they're small like that, think of a pericardial effusion. And you get the ultrasound on them, and they do have a pericardial effusion. There's a malignant effusion. All right, the next few slides, not these ones, <laughs> the truck, the next few slides are ischemia. And picking subtle ischemic changes is one of the key, the key things you're going to be able to do after you learn these five little rules that I have, or six. But this is a, um, this is a, a slide that I wanted to show you. What's the definition of insanity? 
but you keep doing the same thing over and over but look for a different result. Okay? So if you're studying a particular way and it's not working, change it. So this is Michael Long. Michael Long lives in Ireland. And unfortunately somebody here has had a little accident with their car, it's gone into the moat. So Michael's the local uh, guy with a crane, he brings his crane in, and he's helping the locals take the car out. It's going really well. Oops. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, look, it's all right. You know, it's, uh, nobody was hurting it, and Michael has another truck. <laughs> so Michael brings the truck along, it's all working really well. Oh my God. <laughs> It's all right, Michael's got another truck. <laughs> and we missed one in between because there's three trucks already in there in the car. So if you're doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, get crazy. So change the way you work if what you're doing at the moment doesn't work for you. So this is your 40-year-old that had this indigestion. Beware indigestion. The patients that have ischemic heart disease, a larger number of them have gastroesophageal reflux disease. Ischemic chest pain begins during eating in, a, in about 8 or 9% of these patients. They can come in with symptoms such as burping, for example. Right? I used to say, do you burp as well? As it can come with chest pain? burping as well? I said, oh, yes. Okay, get out of here. Right? It's, it's real. Studies are showing, be careful not to use indigestion. So, this is the ECG. So, can anybody tell me, is there an ischemic change there? The first person that tells me what the ischemic change is, you'll get one year subscription to own the ECG. I'm going to throw in one year subscription for the cardiac boot camp videos. That's like 300 videos. There's like, I don't know, every ECG you can imagine. Um, and, uh, you, and a Mercedes. I'm going to throw in a Mercedes. <laughs> I've been trying to get that Mercedes towed for years, but you can have it. So, can anybody pick anything here? Go on. All right, so, so make sure you give James your email, because you won. Fantastic. Right. Can we just give him a round of applause? Because he has got that. So, this is what happens to this guy right after you're about to discharge him. Is that significant? Just a little tombstone anterolateral infarct with reciprocal changes here. And so the ST segments are important. The morphology of the ST segment becomes important. And if we look at this one, another tombstone anterior inf anterolateral infarct with reciprocal inferior changes. Another one with lateral ST elevation with reciprocal changes. Reciprocal changes become important. So these are my little six rules. Poor R wave progression is number one. Hyperacute T waves, and I use the saying the T wave towers over the R wave in V4. Reciprocal SEG changes are important. ST segment might be straight or convex. There's a terminal distortion, which is this QRT thing where the, where the ST comes off very, very quickly. It doesn't, it doesn't do what this does, you see how it comes up nice and gently up here, this comes off right off it. And beware T wave inversion and AVL. Now, do these things always have to be present? No. And that's the thing about it, you've got to be suspicious, that's why the history becomes important. So this guy here has got this hyperacute T wave. You see, in V4, the T wave towers over the R wave. And it shouldn't, because if you look at the normal R wave progression in this one, you have a look at what it's doing in V4 up there. That's what it should be doing. How about this? This is a patient we had, 23-year-old male, with six hours of sharp central chest pain. Really atypical pain, but he did have some heaviness as well and diaphoresis. So, again, a hyperacute T wave. Have a look at it here. But the diagnosis was, is it STEMI or is this a pericarditis? He's got some He's, he's got some PR depression there in a couple of places. He's got no reciprocal changes. Hmm. Okay. I thought they all had to have reciprocal changes. He's got this hyperacute T wave though, which is a concern. So the diagnosis here was going to be pericarditis. I looked at the ECG and said, no, these are hyperacute T waves. I'm very concerned about these. Also, this is the QRT sign. 
That's the QRT sign up there. And the complex here has got a straight part to the ST segment. Now the QRT sign and a straight part to the segment. So, I think we're going to go for ischemia. Cath lab. Pain was sort of getting better. 99% proximal, 100% distal LAD in a 23-year-old. So these changes are really important. So the last one is, in terms of ischemia is this, T-wave inversion in AVL. Do you see that? So someone else said, if you sneak in to theatre when the cardiothoracic surgeons have opened up the chest and you tie off the right coronary, just, just while they're not looking, that's the first thing that happens. Now, some, in some patients, it's associated with a, with a mid-LAD lesion, depending on the anatomy. So this is the next ECG in this patient. Mm, a little bit, yeah, you know. He's got some changes there in one and AVL. Eh, if you're not convinced, though, how about that one? That's his next one. All right, so T-wave inversion and AVL is very, very important. And the important thing to remember is that your TP line is your baseline. So this patient had chest pain and was taken to the cath lab because they said there was ST elevation in, in the inferior leads. But if you draw the TP lines in there, there is no ST elevation. His cath was totally normal. And this is our last case. 40-year-old male that I had come into the ED a few years ago and he had this seizure that lasted 10, 15 seconds. He wasn't post-dictal, he was waking up. He'd just come back from the methadone clinic across the road. And the nurse said to me, look, he's malingering. He just, he wants something. He wants drugs of some sort, don't he? So, well, let's put him in the research cubicle. Let's have a little look at him. He's kind of not quite right. So, we do the ECG. So, what's the ECG? What's the most significant thing that stands out about this CCG. Look at his corrected QT up there. Very prolonged. And if you're unsure about a corrected QT, if the end of a T wave is about halfway or more than halfway between your RR intervals, that's a prolonged QT. The computer will usually work it out for you. And this is the only thing that I actually believe on the computer readout. Everything else is rubbish. All right? You don't, you don't pay attention. You can look at it, but don't really base your diagnosis on it. But the QT corrected, it's easier, it's easier to look at this and this is right, rather than me trying to work it out using a formula. So he's got a prolonged QT. And so I said, well, can you just shoot off another ECG just because those, you know, those ectopics here, they're in the way. I want to really look at the full ECG. And so he does this during the next ECG. What's that looking like now? Torsades. So we put the paddles on him, and of course he complies, uh, and he, he goes into full torsades. So you've got to treat him, and because he's a prolonged QT, um, they'll treat him with magnesium, potassium, and then the way we, we try to sort these guys out is we speed their rate up, so you give them some isoprenaline. So the, the faster the rate, the smaller the QT corrected in these patients. Okay, so. Torsades, only when you have a prolonged QT. Otherwise, it's a polymorphic VT by name. And if it's not a prolonged QT, it's a polymorphic VT, you treat those with amiodarone. So, anything above 450 milliseconds I worry about in terms of QT. So, we've gone through the history, how to calculate the rate. Is it sinus? So you look at the P wave axis, are uh, the P waves upright in two inverted in AVR? You make sure there's no limb lead reversal by looking at the P wave in one and making sure that it's upright. You make sure that there's a P wave for every QRS. If there's more P waves than there are QRSs, you've got to start thinking about an AV nodal block. And then when you do the AV nodal, when you think about AV nodal block, you've got to make sure that your PP interval is regular for it to be an AV nodal block. Uh, then you go through your QRSs. Are they tall, hypertrophy? Are they small? Is there something stopping you from seeing them, like an effusion of some sort? Are they wide? Is it a VT? 
Is it a hyperkalemia? Is it a bundle branch block? Or narrow? Is this an S feature? Or is it just sinus rhythm we're looking at? Does it have abnormal morphology? Does it have a delta wave or a slurred upstroke that might point to WPW? And are your complexes clumped? Because if they're clumped and you haven't seen a MOBITS, go back and have another look because you might have missed it. Look at your ST segments and make sure that you pick up the subtle ischemic changes. Great to find them early rather than wait for the segments to go up. Um, look at the intervals. Now, you're going to see all this stuff as you're going through, but I look at the PR, I look at the QT interval, and one last thing that I do is I look at pacing spikes. And I look at every lead to make sure I haven't missed a pacing spike. And for me, this system yields a significant number of diagnoses that I need in the emergency department. Now, when we go through STT segments, we also, on the, in the full system, we cover Brigadas, and we cover Wellens, and we cover all the other things that, that are important to not miss. But there's not many of those. So, I invite you to go to resus.com.au. I've put this, this section on there just for you guys. So if you go to, uh, what's it called, core, core knowledge, and you, you scroll down and hit ECGs, you, you can hit ECG topics or own the ECG method, which is what I recommend, and I've put a video up there for you, which is about 10 minutes, which goes through the whole uh, process, and then you can click on each one of these modules and do the modules. And it takes about two hours to do the whole thing. A two hour investment that might save the patient's life. So I invite you to go to the website and take part of it. Thank you very much. Email me if you've got any questions and send me interesting ECGs. I'm happy to put them up on the website and discuss your cases. Thank you very much.